Okay, so now everyone's been reminded one more time that this meeting is going to be recorded. And if you don't want to be recorded, please turn off your video. I want to welcome everyone to the League of Women Voters and Sierra Club joint meeting on environmental pollutants versus human health. And the winner is my name is Linda Smith, current chair of the Sierra Club Loxahatchee Group. We represent Palm Beach County, Martin County, Indian River, and Okeechobee counties. In a few days, we're going to have this recording up on our Sierra Club Loxahatchee Group YouTube. You may know about National Sierra Club as the oldest grassroots environmental organization in the United States. It was founded in 1892. Locally, we are all members of the Florida chapter. This is a list of some of our ambitious initiatives and just a little you're going to we're going to be hearing about stop sugar burning later on. So spoiler alert. Um, I do invite everyone to please join us. We have a lot to, a lot of work to do on all of these initiatives. Also, after the meeting, please go to our website and explore the wealth of information that's there. I'd like to direct you to the bottom of the home page where we have upcoming activities. Um, this calendar lists all of our committee meetings, outings, cleanups, and they're all listed there on the website all the time. We have seven different kayaking trips scheduled right now. So I'm sure if you go there, you will find something of interest. I would also like to invite everyone to our next general meeting how to build a powerful environmental coalition of voters. This may be of special interest to the League of Women Voters, I, I kind of think. Um, so also at the end of this presentation, anyone who can please stay for five minutes for some envir local environmental news. Um, so uh, without further ado, please mark your calendars for the March 24th meeting, How to Build Powerful Environmental Coalition of Voters. And I would like to introduce Kathy Gunlatch, President of the Palm Beach County League of Women Voters. Take Thank it away, you, Linda. Kathy. Thank you, Linda. We are excited to do this joint effort tonight um, with the Sierra Club. The League of Women Voters is a grassroots group also, and our mission is to empower voters and to defend democracy. And we've got a lot of work out there for us. If you've been keeping up with the Florida legislature, what's going on, it's somewhat heartbreaking at times. But we advocate for voters. We advocate for citizens. We work on various issues from education to gun safety to the environment. So we have a lot of things in common with you all. Um, Linda did a good ad for the, the Sierra Club. And I wanna say, look at our website. We would love you to join us. One of the things we are doing now in the state is we are suing the state over Senate Bill 90, um, which we feel really hurts voters. Um, it changes um, vote by mail, access to um, drop boxes, all kinds of things. So that is what we do. We protect voting rights. So we register voters. If you're not registered, please register. And having said that, um, go to our website, join the league, become active. We, we really do a lot of great work. So having said that, I'm trying to get to where I need to get to. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Brent Schillinger, who is co-chair of the League of Women Voters Palm Beach County Healthcare Committee, a past president of the Palm Beach County Medical Society, and currently chairs the society's opi I can't talk, opioid healthcare response initiative. He received his MD at Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. He has chaired the Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs for both the Palm Beach County Medical Society and the Florida Medical Society. Brent represents the medical community on the Palm Beach Ethics Coalition and serves as vice chair of the Florida Policy Institute 
a nonpartisan think tank that focuses on the fiscal impact of education, affordable housing, food supply, and healthcare issues. He holds the clinical academic appointments at Nova Southeastern University, Florida Atlantic University, and the University of Miami. Dr. Schillinger is going to be our moderator for this evening. And I do have to add one more thing about the league. We are nonpartisan. Um, we don't support candidates. We don't support parties, but we are political where we take stands on issues. So Brent, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. So welcome everyone to this evening's program. The title, as, as you've seen in all the promotional material and on the screen here is Environmental Pollutants versus Human Health and the winner is. So hopefully we'll have some idea by the end of this evening's program who the winner is. There's a lot of issues here, a lot of issues here. We're gonna take a look at some of them. This is such a timely discussion, you know, every day in the news, including in the news today, there's discussion of the environmental pollutants and how they affect us, particularly our health. Uh, you see that whether you look at the Palm Beach Post, the Sun Sentinel, whether it's NPR, Apple News, Yahoo News, or uh, one of the many other news sources. There's so many of those out there today. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of issues. Uh, two of the areas that you're gonna hear a lot of focus on this evening with the local perspective is the uh, pre-harvest burns with, we already heard some uh, reference to that from Big Sugar, and then the Lake Okeechobee pollution issue, Lake Okeechobee and estuaries with the red tide and the blue-green algae and how that affects everything. So tonight, the focus is going to be on the health impact, which I think is really a critical issue. You know, we can talk about all the other things uh, and the health impact when it comes to environmental pollutants often plays second fiddle to economic and political priorities. And we'll be talking about some of those as well, but the emphasis on the health impact. So we have an esteemed panel of all-star speakers this evening, uh, four of them. We're gonna first hear an overview of health impact from environmental pollutants. That'll be presented by Dr. Ankush Bansal. Then a clinician's perspective from the trenches. Dr. Anthony Pearson Shaver will be here with that. Uh, that'll be followed by the Sierra Club's overview of environmental injustice issues presented by Patrick Ferguson. And then what can we do moving forward to really make a difference. Howard Simon is here to give us that information. And of course, there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers. Please put them in the chat and uh, we'll do our best to make sure we get to those as well. So first up, Dr. Ankush Bansal. And you know, each of the four speakers are actually people that I kind of have some personal connection with. Uh, Ankush and myself have worked together on some projects uh, through Palm Beach County Medical Society and the Florida Medical Association. As far as his credentials, he is a Palm Beach County-based traveling hospitalist, board certified internal medicine and lifestyle medicine. He earned his MD from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, did his residency training at Christiana Care in Wilmington, Delaware. Currently, Dr. Bonsell serves as a voluntary clinical assistant professor of medicine at the FIU College of Medicine in Miami. He's governor-elect of the Florida chapter of the American College of Physicians. Most relevant to tonight's program, Dr. Bonsell is co-founder and co-chair of the Florida, Florida Clinicians for Climate Action. He's also co-founder of Climate Reality Project Palm Beach, and he's a board member of the Florida Physicians for Social Responsibility. Dr. Ankush Bansal. Thanks so much, Brent. Hi, everybody. My name is Ankush Bansal. And as Brent mentioned, I am a hospitalist and internist based in Delray Beach, Florida. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the environmental hazards that can affect human health here in Florida. Now, there's a lot of these um, uh, environmental hazards. There's things like microplastics and water and food, the forever chemicals and water, soil and food as well, PCBs, smoke from sugarcane refineries and industry, over fertilization, water and soil, and aerial pesticides. So there's a lot of things, but today I'm only gonna focus on two things. The first is gonna be the alg algal blooms, and the second is gonna be on lead poisoning particularly in water. So let me start off with algal blooms. So 
So this is a satellite photo taken in July of 2018 of the southwest corner of Lake Okeechobee. And as, if you can see, you can see that there is this greenish cloud in the middle of the lake. Now that's not normal. What that is, is algae. It's an algal bloom. And this has become an almost annual event in Florida. And it affects Palm Beach and Martin counties particularly in 2016 and 2018. So what causes algae blooms? Well, it's nutrient pollution from domestic, industrial, and agricultural waste, resulting in high concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus, which then spill into the waterways. And again, these come primarily from agriculture, leaky septic systems, and fertilizer runoff. Now, all of this is due to climate change, such as heat, drought, soil erosion, but also water management policies, which result in soil nutrient depletion and animal waste in water. So what's the climate change link? Well, climate change makes algal blooms worse. The higher the temperature, the more nutrient pollution there is, and therefore the more algal blooms. And the warmer it gets, the harder it will be to control unless we control the nutrient input into the water. So this is a picture of the Gulf during a red tide. And you can tell it's a red tide because you see this red stripe out in the ocean where it shouldn't be. Now, red tides primarily occur from saltwater sources that then invade the lakes, rivers, and estuaries. And it's from an organism uh, class called dinoflagellates. There's also blue-green algae, which are generally beneficial, but when the water has a low salt concentration because of over-fertilization, the algae create what's called a surface scum, which, cut, which cuts off oxygen and nutrients and makes the water acidic. So what are some of these agents that affect us here in Florida? And by the way, all of them cause direct hum human health hazards. Well, the most talked about one are cyanotoxins and this organism called Carinia brevis. But there's some others that affect us here in Florida, particularly in Lake Okeechobee. Pseudonychia is another organism. This produces a toxin called amnesic shellfish poisoning. Perodinium produces something called saxi toxins. And gambardiscus, which produces a toxin that causes ciguatera fish poisoning, which many of you may have heard of before. Now, this is different than what happens in the Gulf of Mexico. So if you hear somebody talking about dinophysis, it can happen in Florida, in the lakes, but it primarily happens more in the Gulf. So what are the health effects of, of algae blooms? So let's talk about Carinia brevis, first of all. Now, these next two slides, there's going to be a lot of information. I just want to give you the overview of how it affects your health. So this Carinia brevis causes the red tide. It produces a neurotoxin. Now, this neurotoxin can be suspended in the air near the beaches. So it can cause breathing problems too. So it's not that you have to be in the water. You can be near the water and still be affected by this. It can accumulate in shellfish that, and this causes neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. So if you eat contaminated shellfish, you can get things like nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, diarrhea. But it also causes widespread kill off of fish, turtles, birds, and marine mammals. Now this occurs more often in Southwest Florida, but it has occurred in Lake Okeechobee and in South Florida. So what are some of the symptoms? You get eye irritation, you can get runny nose, cough, you can have trouble breathing, you can get dizziness, and you can get skin rashes. And, I've, and I saw this back in 2016 working up in Stewart, um, some of these skin rashes and the, and the breathing problems. But most people recover in a few days, and the remedy is, you know, get away from the beach um, because then you're not going to be near the exposure. But because it causes breathing problems, this can be really problematic for people with asthma, COPD, or the elderly. Now, scientists have done some study on this, and they've looked at manatees who have died because of this. And obviously, manatees can't get away from the water because they live in water. And what they found on autopsy of these manatees is that they develop bleeding in the lungs, meningitis, and something called hemolytic anemia, where your red blood cells basically blow up or get destroyed in your body. 
So what about some of the other organisms that I mentioned? Well, pseudonychia, that's the one that causes amnesic shellfish poisoning. So this can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, just like before. But the difference is this can also cause disorientation, short-term memory loss, even seizure, coma, or death. And because of that, sometimes people need seizure medicines in severe cases. The next one, pyridinium, this is the, this is the organism that causes the saxitoxin that I mentioned before. Now, this is neurotoxic. As little as a 10-minute exposure, you can start getting symptoms, and it may last several days. And you can get ting tingling, numbness, balance issues, appear as if you're drunk, but it can also lead to you stopping breathing. And the problem with this is there's no antidote for this. The last thing I mentioned was ciguatera poisoning. This comes from coral reef communities. And there's an estimate in the, in the scientific literature that about a million people are poisoned by this globally every year. And in fact, they estimate that 50% of the residents of the Virgin Islands have had this at least once in their life. Now with this, you can get all of the symptoms I mentioned for the other two, but you can get heart rhythm problems too. So it can cause cardiac issues. So that's scary. Moving on to lead poisoning. So lead poisoning, particularly in water, is a bigger problem than Flint, Michigan. The sources are plumbing, industrial, mines, and smelter waste. Now, interestingly, the US government says that the safe, quote, safe level of lead in the water is a concentration of 15 micrograms per liter. But the funny thing is the World Health Organization says, no, it's one microgram per liter. The EPA says that the blood lead level, so different than the lead in the water, but your, the level of lead in your blood in children should be less than five uh, micrograms per deciliter. But if you talk to medical experts and read the studies, all of them say it should be zero. There should not be lead in your blood at all. Any amount of lead can be dangerous. Now, the important thing here for everybody to, to understand is that if you have plumbing in your house or in your office that was built before 1988, it could contain lead. And the reason is the EPA banned lead solder and other lead materials in household plumbing in June of 1988. It can also be in brass fixtures if it was before that time. So because of that, the recommendation is if you have those old pipes, filter your tap water and the other thing that, that I guess most people don't know is that if you have those, those possible lead containing pipes, don't run hot water from your tap because apparently hot water will leach more lead out of the pipe than cold water. So instead get the cold water and just boil it if you need hot water. So what are the health effects? Well, it affects children more than adults. And that's because children absorb 30 to 75% of the lead from water when they ingest it while adults absorb only 11%. It can taste sweet, but usually it's tasteless. And here's, here's, the, here's the kicker here. A 10 microgram deciliter increase in blood lead levels can result in a loss of two IQ points. So it results in decreased intelligence and growth. It can affect your hearing, irritability, weight loss, vomiting, even coma and convulsions. It can cause damage to the brain, kidneys, and bone marrow. An important point here. So if you have lead in the water, technically bathing is okay because the skin can't absorb the lead from the water. It's ingestion. Now, skin can absorb lead in other ways, but from the water, no. And if you have a well at your house, this is a very important point. If you have somebody who's pregnant, an infant or a child under age 18, and you use well water, test it make sure there's no lead because it's possible there could be lead. So what's being done in Florida about this? Well, in the current session, there's actually three bills, two in the Senate, one in the House, talking about lead in the water, primarily in, in the public schools. Um, these are the sponsors and the co-sponsors. You can see that there's three from South Florida, one from each of the South Florida counties. All are moving through committees. And Senator Farmer from Broward, he put out a press release when he introduced Senate Bill 1648 last month. And this is, this is a quote that I picked out from there. 
So they tested um, uh, several school campuses around the state. And in those school campuses they tested, 50% had a lead content that was higher than the dangerous threshold, dangerous level threshold. And on top of that, most of the schools in the state were built before 1988. So therefore the hypothesis is, is that there's probably a lot more schools that have lead in their water and we just don't know about it. And children have been getting poisoned with lead for decades in the Florida public schools. So they're working on trying to um, rectify that. Moving on to lead poisoning in air. This usually comes from general industry, shipyards and construction. Now OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, says the government organization that protects workers in their place of employment, they say that the maximum exposure limit is 50. Don't worry about the units. It's just 50 micrograms per cubic meter in eight hours. That's, that's in the air. But they mandate that the employers have to take action when it hits 30. And what they say is that when their blood lead level is above 40, then the employer has to keep them away from that exposure until the blood, level, blood lead level goes below 40 or 50, depending on the industry. And you're probably all aware of the infamous Gopher Resource case in Tampa last year, where there was a big release of lead, or actually it wasn't sudden, it was known for a long time. Um, and a lot of people have gotten poisoned and they're still following that. So far, they know of at least 16 children that were directly affected by this, probably many, many more. Lastly, lead poisoning in soil. So this can track into homes. Kids can directly ingest it. You know, when kids play outside, some of the dirt or they're in the sandbox and eat sand, could be lead there. And then this is kind of scary. If you have a lot of lead in the soil, apparently your vegetables can take it up from your vegetable garden. So that's another scary thing. Now, naturally soil has less than 50 parts per million of lead, but urban areas can be more than 200 parts per million. Back in 1994, there was a scientific study where they studied areas of Tampa, and they found that there were a lot of areas in Tampa that had more than 500 parts per million. And then lastly for this, this is kind of scary, and I really don't understand this, is that the EPA says that the standard for playgrounds, play areas, you can have 400 parts per million of lead in the play areas, 1,200 in the non-play areas before you have to take action. So I'm gonna stop there. These are some of the resources um, that you can use to follow the algal blooms, both from the federal government as well as from the state. Um, and then uh, some information about the gopher resource case in Tampa. And then these are the sources that I use to get some of that data. So I'll stop there. And if there's any questions, um, I'll uh, follow the lead of, of Dr. Schillinger. Thank you. Thank you, Ankush, for that uh, excellent overview of some of the uh, pollutant problems that we have in Florida. The more we hear about it, the scarier it is. Uh, that's why it's so important that we're having these discussions. So next up, Dr. Anthony Pearson Shaver. I know the guy I know, Tony and I have worked together uh, training residents at the uh, Palm Beach Consortium for Graduate Education. I think they still call it that. These names change frequently. Uh, Tony is director of the Pediatric Residency Program at the Children's Hospital at Palms West. He chairs and is clinical professor at Nova Southeastern University's Kiran Patel College of Allopathic Medicine. Dr. Pearson Shaver received his MD from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, after which he completed a residency at the National Health Service Corps in Tennessee. He trained as a pediatric critical care fellow at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, spent 26 years at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University, where he served as medical director of the pediatric transport team and pediatric ICU. He's, been, he's chief of uh, pediatric critical care medicine and the clinical service chief there of pediatric medicine. Dr. Pearson Shaver served as chair of pediatrics at Mercer University School of Medicine and medical director at the Children's Hospital Navicent Health in Macon, Georgia. So Tony's gonna bring us up to date on some of his personal observations and some work he's doing to uh, scientifically uh, have some evidence-based data to talk about some of the uh, specific environmental pollutants and their health uh, implications right here in Palm Beach County. Tony. Oh, well, 
thank you very much. Uh, I don't have slides and I'm gonna leave, leave this discussion depend, uh, pretending that all you guys are parents of a patient, okay? Uh, one of the things that we know is that children who have very reactive lungs respond to particulate matter in the air. And particularly with the, um, with the practice of the pre-harvest burning of the sugar cane, we suspect that children in those areas have more problems during those times of the year than they do at other times. Let's start talking a little bit about asthma and then we'll talk about our, our observations. Asthma is an allergic reaction to something. Now, generally it's something that's uh, either related to uh, something the patient's directly allergic to. Like for instance, a kid with nuts who walks into a house where they've been baking, um, a kid with a nut allergy rather, who walks in the house where his grandma has been baking um, pecan rolls all day long. I'm from Georgia, so it's pecan rolls. Uh, or you've got a, uh, a patient who is particularly allergic to, to a particular pollen walks into a greenhouse or probably more commonly what happens, the kid goes to the fair and then starts having, having some trouble. But asthma attacks can also be brought on by changes in weather. Um, generally it's going from hot to cold, but it probably is not cold enough in Florida for that to be a real big problem as it is for some, some of our friends north. We also notice it in some children who, uh, with exercise, that there is exercise-induced asthma that can cause some problems. And the asthma itself, there are three components of asthma in terms of how it affects your lungs. One is it creates an inflammation in the smaller airways so that the airway wall gets a little thicker. Two is it actually creates or causes what we call bronchospasm. So the smooth muscle in the airway gets tighter and narrows the, uh, the channel through which the patients breathe. And the third thing is because of all the inflammatory response with, with respect to all the, uh, um, the defense mechanisms that are brought into play is that patients then also develop a lot more mucus in those airways. Asthma is a big problem in the United States. Like uh, I was reading the data, some of the data that my residents reported they reported 5 million kids with asthma. I think that it's a little bit more than that. Asthma does also tend to have a regional and, uh, and important ethno, uh, ethnocentric, I guess you'd call it, uh, epidemiology. It's much more common in the Southeast, the Southwest, though they do, I mean, though you can see it throughout the country, much more common, more common ethnically and African-American and Hispanic children. So, you know, we got two big populations of that here. Shortly after I arrived in, uh, in Loxahatchee, I had a couple residents that approached me with, uh, you know, the, it seems to be a couple times of the year that our asthma admissions really increase. And uh, so we wanted to take a look at that. And what uh, we did was we, looked at children from 2016 to 2018, so well before, um, uh, before COVID, and we divided each year into four quarters. So quarter one, which is January to March, and quarter four, which is September to December, are, are the primary burning seasons. So then in quarter two and quarter three, which are the spring and summer, are are relatively free. And what we noticed was that in our area, and our area being Loxahatchee at, at Palms West, that the number of asthma exacerbations increases during uh, quarters one and four. And it's a relatively um, significant increase. The, and as you suspect with the other epidemiologic factors, it, it follows that we have more African-American children and more Hispanic children that are, that are presenting and getting 
getting admitted for during those times for asthma exacerbation. Because we work through HCA, uh, there were some limits that were placed on the amount of data that we could get. So there are a few things that I think I need to be fully, um, I have full disclosure need to express. One, we don't have good community level data. That means that we were not actually allowed to track kids by, um, by their zip codes because within, in order for us to do that, we would have had to have a different sort of uh, IRB request, an IRB uh, proposal. I think if second steps of this project will probably be done through NOVA and then we'll be able to get sort of to some of that granular, more granular material. Um, and in addition to that, we weren't able to, to kind of identify, do any further evaluation of where patients were coming. So I can't tell you how many kids came from Bell Glade versus how many came from uh, Pahokee uh, versus how many came from Clewiston. We know though that those are the primary areas that a lot of these kids are coming from there as well as um, some kids closer to us in Palm Beach County. And another uh, thing too that I think we need to consider that we've got to fare it out a little bit more as we did our study, we tried very hard to, um, to, uh, to exclude those children who might have had a cause for their asthma other than just an allergy. That is the kids who had um, respiratory diseases, viruses, we, and we could uh, correlate that with some sort of viral infection. But, there, but it still represents a little bit of a problem with our patients because it just so happens that quarters two and four happen to be during the spring and summer when fewer kids are sick. So that if you kind of look at the, uh, at the admission rate at children's hospitals, you would notice that if you started in July, remember my world starts in July. My year always starts in July, with July 1st with the new intern. So we sort of follow an intern's experience. In pediatrics, they kind of get there and they're wondering, what in the world the hospital was built for because nobody's there. You know, because no kid, kids don't get sick. And in this area, since we're not a big trauma center and a big surgery center, we don't see them. But then as October comes around, suddenly the people who are working on the floor are going, oh my goodness, could somebody just do something to keep some of these kids at home? Because all of a sudden the pediatric population swells and it swells from about October to March, at which time the kids get sick well again and it decrease as well. Because of the way we divided our patients, I think that some of the factors that, that influence our admission may be related to the fact that it's just summertime and kids don't tend to get as sick as often dur during the summer. So that some of the secondary respiratory illnesses we might not have seen. But I think that we have enough data to suggest that that the increase of particulate matter uh, in the air during the times that the cane is being burned, I think it suggests that there might be a, an association and we could look a little bit further. Uh, and, and I've got to tell you all, this, it, I would love to see our part of Florida go to a no burning agricultural business. Uh, I don't know that that will help, but as a pediatrician, what I'm most interested in seeing is it would be helpful, I think, if the um, if somehow the the farmers could let us know when burning is going to happen, and I think that some of the some of the pediatricians in the area could then adjust how they're treating patients. Shortly after I moved here, I actually um, a, a pediatrician from Bahoki is a member of my church. And I mentioned this all to her, and she kind of looked at me as if I had three heads. And said, you realize that we, that for our most brittle asthmatics and our kids with chronic lung disease, we just increased their medicine in October. We increase it in October, and then if, you know, if things have gone okay, then we decrease it again in March. And it's like, okay, so we're, we, we have found a way to work around the problem without actually, without actually, um, 
addressing it. Realizing the impact the Florida crystals, and you, what is it, U.S. sugar has on the economy in this area, I think it would be, it would be very difficult to, to politically try to change minds. But I don't think any of the, the farmers or the executives at either of those two country companies rather are, would be adverse to trying to help to partnering with us to, to help sort of control the problem. So, you know, I think that, and just as an aside, a, a mutual friend of, of Brent's and mine is Brad Foyer. Brad, it happens to be the, um, what is it? He's the chief surgeon for, for the Florida Highway Patrol. And for about a year and a half, uh, when he got out, if, particularly when he was on the road, he would get out and if he saw the big fume clouds coming across Palm Beach County, he would take a picture and send it to me. And I got to tell you, they're pretty impressive looking. The people at the, I visited Florida Crystal, and their scientists actually think that those small, they, that when they burn, their particles are very small, they go directly up to the jet stream, and they go east. So that nobody between uh, Bell Glade and I'll, I will say Palm Beach has to deal with that. Now, everybody on this, I'm sure on this call, recognizes that gravity is a thing. You know, so that if there's not a jet stream or the wind is, the wind there is not blowing faster than the wind every place else, it gets deposited. You know, so, I mean, I think that, that um, you know, Brad would always tell me they're just doing magical thinking. It's just a magical thinking thing that ultimately they'll come along. But I do think that it is an issue for our community. And uh, there have actually been a couple other reports. I think the, the Sierra Club um, published a report probably about six months ago. And um, I can't remember who did the second study, but there is another, there is a study out there that actually isn't, isn't much closer than ours to being able to define the population that are affected. So my 12 minutes are up. Um, I, I'm perfectly willing to take questions since I have 15, but I think Brent wants to leave those to the end. Sounds good. Well, th thanks, Tony, for sharing um, some of your personal perspectives. I think that gives us some really, uh, really excellent insight as to what's going on here. Next up, Patrick Ferguson with the Sierra Club. Uh, I'll mention my connection with the Sierra, well, Patrick, I've met over Zoom as we've planned this meeting. My connection with the Sierra Club actually goes back to 1963 as a 10-year-old little boy growing up in the Hudson Valley in, in New York. And in those days, uh, there was something called the Con Edison Hydroelectric Project at Storm King Mountain. That's right where I lived in Cornwall. And this was supposed to be the greatest thing for our community. It was gonna bring in all kinds of tax uh, dollars and jobs and all this kind of stuff and the Sierra Club was painted as the enemy a bunch of bird watchers I remember that uh, uh, reference and uh, so as a little kid you know I thought the right thing to do was go around getting people to sign petitions that we want this project get these environmentalists out of here certainly over the years I, th I think uh, the understanding of what's going on has changed but that, that's just a kind of a reference to how uh, media and public opinion and big money can sway things. I mean, that, that was like a 40-year uh, fight, and finally they gave up. And, and you look back and you see if, if Con Edison uh, had uh, persisted, they would have cut away like half of the mountain. There'd be all kinds of problems going on. So played a very important role, but I always think of Sierra Club back, back in the early 60s. Anyway, Patrick, he comes to us through the Sierra Club where he is the organizing representative of the group's Stop Sugar Field Burning campaign. Stop the Burn. Patrick's an attorney. He received his law degree from Nova Southeastern University School of Law and his undergraduate degree in political science from the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining the Sierra Club, Patrick was engaged in private general practice and local activism for numerous environmental and progressive causes in the Broward County area. He organized Fort Lauderdale's Global Climate March in November of 2015. He was an adjunct professor teaching 
uh, undergraduate courses then of environmental law at Nova Southeastern. So Patrick, please bring us your perspective. All right, thank you very much. Uh, sorry to everyone uh, today. Uh, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to give you a more focused presentation uh, on uh, pre-harvest sugar field burning. Uh, you know, uh, do a brief overview uh, of the issue uh, in general and its negative impacts, but really, uh, you know, touch upon uh, what I have learned uh, uh, in working on this issue uh, hand in hand uh, with residents from uh, the Glades communities who are ultimately leading uh, this campaign work uh, over the past five years to give you a sense of, uh, of, of how they're impacted uh uh by this issue uh on a, on a yearly basis first and foremost uh though uh for those of you who aren't as uh familiar with uh the how and the why of uh pre-harvest sugar field burning uh historically speaking uh sugar growers uh dating back uh before the age of modern mechanical harvesters uh had been in the practice of uh burning the outer leaves uh and tops of the sugarcane plant uh, to remove pests from the field uh, and make the cane uh, uh, much more easier uh, to cut prior to harvest. Flash forward to the age of uh, mechanical harvesters, uh, which are uh, equipped to mechanically separate uh, uh, the leaves and tops from the sugar cane uh, bearing billets. The practice is maintained uh, as a means to make for uh, a quicker and cheaper harvest overall. Uh, by reducing uh, the overall amount of uh, biomass uh, plant material uh, that the uh, sh sugar growers, sugar manufacturers uh, have to uh, process uh, and transport. And to give you uh, uh, all an idea of uh, the scope uh, of the, the practice, takes place uh, you know, roughly each year, uh, 400,000 acres of sugarcane fields are, are burned in Florida. Sugarcane is grown uh, in all the counties which border Lake Okeechobee, uh, but the vast majority, uh, roughly 75% of the commercial acreage is grown uh, right here in Palm Beach County. And um, uh, the season begins uh, in October of each year uh, and lasts uh, for the past few years uh, uh, through early to mid-May. Uh, and to give a further idea of the scale, uh, the EPA's National Emissions Inventory Database uh, for Agricultural Fires uh, lists Palm Beach County uh, as producing more emissions uh, from agricultural fires than any other county uh, in the entire United States. Now, uh, to get into uh, uh, the pollution uh, that is produced, there have been uh, several uh, emissions factor uh, studies, including uh, multiple that have been carried out in Florida that uh, have identified uh, the wide variety of, uh, of pollutants that are, are produced by burning uh, sugar cane, uh, as I've uh, got listed uh, on the slide right there. Uh, and certainly there's a large body of research, um, you know, that, uh, that links uh, uh, the various uh, health elements uh, connected with exposure uh, to such uh, pollutants. But um, uh, one recent uh, study I'd like to draw your attention to uh, um, that I have referenced uh, on the slide uh, from a few months ago, um, uh, this came out of the University of, uh, uh, of Stanford, uh, a project they were doing to map uh, wildfire uh, exposure and impacts across the uh, entire United States. And they, uh, they made a surprising finding that they weren't expecting. Uh, and then uh, the zip codes uh, within uh, uh, Florida where sugarcane grows, uh, have some of the worst recorded smoke days uh, throughout the year uh, than any other zip codes in the entire United States, including those in California that have been uh, subject to uh, historical wildfire impacts uh, in recent years. Furthermore, uh, there's been a large body of medical research around the world and, uh, and, and also in other states uh, relating uh, uh, to uh, the health impacts uh, related to exposure to uh, sugarcane burning uh, pollution. But uh, as Dr. Uh, Pearson Shaver uh, referred to early, uh, earlier, 
Uh, there's not been uh, detailed research that has been carried out uh, uh, in Florida as of yet. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, this is what came out of some of the uh, 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 investigative reporting uh, done by ProPublica, which was in partnership with uh, uh, several academics. Uh, and they were able to actually uh, um, take uh, some zip code uh, information for Belglade, uh, the largest of, uh, of uh, the cities uh, within the Everglades agricultural area impacted by sugarcane bur burning and did find that there was uh, up to 35% uh, increase for uh, respiratory hospital admissions uh, uh, during uh, those months. And certainly, as I'll get in a, a little bit more in my presentation, um, uh, that it's the respiratory impacts uh, that I hear the most about. Uh, in dealing uh, uh, with uh, folks uh, within uh, the Glades uh, communities. In fact, I was shocked uh, when I first started uh, um, uh, organizing the communities. I heard several stories that, uh, you know, residents had been told by their doctors that uh, the best long-term solution for some of their reoccurring respiratory uh, health impacts is simply move. Uh, to another um, uh, area with better year-round uh, air quality, which is not something many folks uh, have the resources, nor the desire to, nor should they have to, uh, within the Glades communities. Uh, it, it's very important to uh, identify what makes pre-harvest sugar field burning a glaring example of an environmental justice uh, issue, which uh, in effect uh, is an example of environmental racism uh, right here. Uh, within Palm Beach County. But to really uh, break that down, you've got to start with the regulations uh, in place. First and foremost, uh, pre-arbor sugar field burning is uh, regulated and permitted by the Florida Forest Service, which is under the control of uh, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So historically speaking, uh, back in the early 90s, uh, as a uh, Central uh, Palm Beach County was getting more built out, in particular communities like Wellington, Royal Palm Beach. Uh, you had uh, residents who, for the first time, uh, were being exposed to the uh, seasonal smoke uh, and ash uh, from sugarcane burning. This led to a large documented public uh, outcry during that time period, uh, which uh, led to uh, the state and the sugar industry to uh, relatively quickly enact a series of, uh, of wind direction and speed-based uh, 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 regulations, which are largely uh, uh, still uh, in place. Uh, and uh, in effect, uh, on a, depending on the location of the field, uh, and the strength and direction of wind on a given day, if it's projected to carry smoke and ash toward uh, central and eastern Palm Beach County, uh, then uh, that burn uh, permit can be denied. Uh, whereas uh, when uh, uh, the wind uh, would carry the smoke and ash uh, uh, towards the Glades communities, uh, which are uh, largely black and brown communities, uh, lower income communities, then uh, there's otherwise minimal uh, 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 protections put in place. So you got a situation where these communities have to uh, bear the brunt uh, of uh, this toxic and outdated uh, harvesting practice, uh, whereby uh, the regulations in place, not to say that folks uh, uh, all throughout the county are impacted, especially to this day, folks, uh, Wellington, and Loxahatchee uh, are impacted. And, uh, you know, in speaking with folks uh, who, who work at the Florida Forest Service, they, they admit they deal with an imperfect science. Uh, wind conditions can change uh, very quickly. But nonetheless, you have a glaring example that the regulations uh, in place uh, do prioritize protecting, uh, uh, you know, communities uh, in the East uh, over uh, communities within the Everglades agricultural area, which remember are wrapped around 75% of the total uh, sugarcane acreage. And this is reflective of a larger problem in our country uh, where, you know, you name it, zoning regulations uh, and, uh, uh, you know, regulations on um, uh, uh, pollution throughout the country, uh, you know, in several different states, uh, uh, prioritize often uh, protecting more affluent white communities while uh, predominantly black and brown communities have to disproportionately uh, uh, suffer from pollution exposures. And that's what makes uh, pre-harvest sugar field burning such a glaring example of an environmental justice issue. But to really break it down, uh, uh, you know, and understand, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, uh, it means, uh, what environmental injustice means, 
you know, uh, try, I try to get people to look through the perspective of, uh, of living in a community, living in a community in Florida where it snows, you know, it snows black snow uh, uh, persistently, uh, asphalt that rains down, uh, you know, stains, uh, you know, all properties in the region uh, for six to eight months uh, out of the year, uh, you know, uh, residents are left to foot the bill, uh, to, you know, clean up the soot off their properties, their, their homes, their cars. And, uh, you know, I hear, uh, you know, in particular, uh, folks have to change their air conditioning filters uh, every month during the harvesting season to uh, uh, keep up with the soot buildup. And uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, homes that don't have uh, within the area that might not have the best ventilation uh, put in place, uh, the type of impacts the, that this persistent soot uh, uh, impact, uh, you know, can build up. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, you know, I often hear uh, uh, from parents uh, uh, whose children suffer from asthma uh, and require the use of nebulizers. Uh, and they have to make tough decisions during the harvesting season as to whether or not uh, to let their kids go out and play uh, and enjoy, you know, outdoor activities. Some of the best times uh, of the year to be outside in Florida, you know, due to concerns uh, about air quality during the harvesting season. And, uh, you know, some of the more emotional conversations uh, uh, I've had uh, have certainly been with folks who, who suffer from issue, severe uh, respiratory issues like COPD. And I've spoken to folks who uh, say, you know, during the harvesting season, they feel like a prisoner in their home sometimes uh, uh, because uh, in days when there's a lot of burning going on, uh, you know, leaving their house and, and, and engaging any kind of strenuous activity could quite literally be a life or death situation. And, um, uh, you know, and going back to, you know, the concerns I often, you know, hear from parents uh, from the perspective uh, to, to really put the, um, you know, the impacts into perspective. We have volunteers who, uh, um, whose children have gone to uh, school. And in fact, this picture I have down in the corner of my screen is taken by a teacher, local res uh, um, elementary school in South Bay called uh, Rosenwald, uh, taken during school hours. And that same school in the past had to be evacuated. Uh, due to the fact that smoke from a nearby burn seeped through the vents, uh, that uh, they had a practice that the vents are supposed to be closed uh, during the harvesting season, and that didn't happen on the date. And uh, up to six kids would be rushed to the hospital after suffer suffering severe asthma attacks and nine others uh, uh, on site. Uh, and then, you know, so imagine this being a part of life, and then, you know, you hear that. Uh, um, uh, that there's an alternative. And in fact, that the sugar industry uh, regularly does uh, practice uh, green harvesting when burn permits are, are denied. Uh, or uh, in certain cir circumstances, like we found out, the sugarcane fields surrounding a, a Walmart in Clueston are green harvested, which is done supposedly as a, as a courtesy uh, uh, to the nearby uh, residents. And this, this community campaign is, is fundamentally all about extending that same courtesy so the folks don't have to deal with, uh, um, you know, this, uh, this pollution uh, and this ashfall uh, from sugarcane fields around their homes, schools, uh, and businesses for eight months uh, out of the year. And to further compound that, uh, you know, you can imagine the frustration uh, uh, that folks have in, you know, seeing that the regulations prioritize, uh, uh, you know, protecting uh, uh, communities towards the east. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what really makes this such a glaring example of an environmental justice issue. And, uh, you know, I, I ask folks to put their, themselves in, their shoe, in, in the shoes of residents, uh, you know, dealing, uh, you know, with this six to eight months out of the year. Ask yourself, uh, you know, would you tolerate having to deal with this persistent pollution, this persistent um, uh, ashfall? Uh, and, uh, you know, the cleanup bills, uh, you know, that you have to, to deal with. And, uh, you know, more often than not, the answer is no. Uh, and, and, you know, nor should the folks in the Glades communities uh, have to deal with this, considering uh, uh, the fact that there's a readily uh, available alternative. Uh, and this alternative, uh, as I can get into a little bit later, uh, can also bring new economic opportunities to the Glades as well. But to really put things in perspective, I've got two short videos. So this is right outside of my home. When I walk out the door, this is how close the smoke covers over our community.
And now I'll show you a video of uh, to kind of capture what the black snow is like on a day during the harvesting season. This was taken in uh, Pahokee. And, uh, you know, uh, to take things back uh, to the campaign, uh, for the past uh, uh, couple years, uh, our primary focus uh, has been uh, uh, pressing uh, the agricultural commissioner, uh, who's currently uh, Nikki Freed, uh, to institute uh, some common sense buffer zone uh, uh, protections, uh, which, uh, you know, would lead, be, lead to a, a first phase and an eventual uh, complete phase out of pre-harvest sugar field burning uh, in favor of grain harvesting and also uh, prioritize uh, uh, protecting uh, it, the most, some of the most impacted communities by pre-harvest sugar field burning. And I'd be happy to share uh, more information on the chat uh, and, and maybe get into more Q&A about how folks can get involved. Uh, and also, generally, um, when I give these presentations, I spend a lot more time getting into uh, uh, the benefits uh, of the alternative uh, of green harvesting. But uh, in the interest of time and also uh, pique your interest, uh, there's going to be a great webinar held next uh, week uh, that will include um, uh, 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 representatives of the Brazilian sugarcane industry. Uh, and it's going to focus how they transitioned away from uh, burning to green harvesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're going to talk about uh, how within the Florida context uh, that, uh, that this could be possible as well. Because uh, certainly uh, um, I'd be happy to get uh, into, uh, you know, more of those details in Q&A. Because uh, certainly this campaign is not about putting the sugar industry out of business. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, protecting public health uh, uh, and, uh, and the environment and creating new opportunity uh, as well. So uh, green harvesting is certainly a win-win-win that we're promoting. Uh, otherwise, I'll leave it uh, at that, and I'd be happy to address uh, further questions during Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for that excellent uh, overview of uh, the, the problems related to the burning of the sugar cane. It, it's just amazing the stuff that's going on so close to home. And now, very important presentation to help guide us into what we can do to make a difference. You know, we have League of Women Voters, we have the Sierra Club, two organizations filled with people who are advocates for the right thing. And, uh, it, and it's frustrating sometimes because it feels like we know what needs to be done. How do we get there? So, up next, Howard. Simon. So Howard and I know each other. We, we both serve on the board of the Florida Policy Institute for the last couple of years. And I'll mention something that's not in his regular CV. I know that Howard uh, was raised in Mount Vernon, New York. So for you Westchester County fans, he's a Mount Vernon guy, which is uh, where my, my dad was born and raised. So Howard holds the distinction of being the longest serving state director in the history of the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. For 21 consecutive years, Howard led the Florida chapter of ACLU. Prior to his leadership in Florida, Howard served as executive director for the Michigan chapter of ACLU. That's a cumulative 44-year career. Makes him the longest in the 100-year history longest for cumulative years at ACLU. Howard earned his undergraduate degree from uh, City College in New York, he earned a PhD in legal and political philosophy from the University of Minnesota. Most pertinent to tonight's focus, after his retirement from the ACLU, he couldn't just sit around and do nothing. Howard created and serves as president of the Clean Okeechobee Waters Foundation. That's a group that works with scientists and physicians who have linked toxins produced by the harmful algal blooms to neurological illnesses, including ALS and Alzheimer's. Howard? Unmute. Okay, that would help. There we go, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Brent. Um, so, I, as Brent indicated, I am not a scientist. I am a policy uh, advocacy person for uh, and have done so for 
uh, more than four decades with the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, but I want to say in the introduction to my remarks and apropos of the title of this presentation, that I don't think it's alarmist to say that the people of Florida, especially people who live near a working or abandoned phosphate mine, or who are rained on by ash from burning sugarcane, or who come in contact with blue-green algae infested waters, or consume fish or breathe air nearby, are slowly being poisoned uh, with liver and other forms of cancer and are, and are at a higher risk for Alzheimer's and ALS, all of which are terminal diseases. So I, uh, some of what I wanted to say has been said already. I wanna briefly review maybe about five, very briefly, five environmental health controversies that are taking place in Florida. And then I wanna end with about a half a dozen uh, political suggestions for how we can address the problem. So the first one I wanna deal with is phosphate mining. Florida provides about 25% of the world's supply for phosphate for fertilizer. I don't know how many of you knew that. Uh, phosphate has been mined in Florida for more than 100 years. Uh, there are more than two dozen mines operating in Florida. They are large open pit mines covering more than 450,000 acres, mostly in West and Central Florida. Non nine phosphate mines are currently active. During the mining process, a radioactive contaminant of phosphate, something called radium-226, is unearthed from buried deposits and piled in mounds on the surface, where it sits, waiting to be blown into the air, into our water, and into our lungs. Um, Radium produces cancer-causing gamma rays that can penetrate the body and increase the risk of many cancers, including lymphoma, leukemia, thyroid, lung, and bladder cancer. These cancers may take years to develop, although some cancers develop sooner. But as radium decays, it eventually turns into radon, and an odorless radioactive gas that has been identified as a carcinogen that can increase the risk of lung cancer. Radon seeps into homes and polluting the indoor air. In many parts of Western uh, Florida, parks and neighborhoods have been built on top of reclaimed phosphate mines, uh, exposing the residents to dangerous levels of radiation left over from the mining process. And this exposure may lead to, leads to an elevated cancer risk. Uh, and as radioactive material from phosphate mining has produced cancer clusters near the mines, the National Cancer Institute has reported a significant increase in the overall rate of childhood cancers in recent decades, up 27% since 1975 in children under age 19, even though the overall incidence of adult cancers has fallen. Okay, phosphate mining. Number two, sugarcane burning. You've already heard about this, and I'm not going to uh, recite what uh, Patrick has already uh, spoken about. But during the burning, of uh, the uh, sugar cane. There has been an increase in hospital admissions for respiratory issues that include breathing problems and chest pains. And there is mounting evidence that Patrick uh, indicated in one of his slides that ash from the burning sugar cane fields can cause long-term health problems. Number three, Florida red tide, Karenia bravis. Um, from 2016, Florida experienced historic outbreaks, both of uh, red tide and massive cyanobacterial blooms along the St. Lucie River to the Indian River Lagoon and down the 140 mile estuary of the Caloosahatchee River. This, has been caused, this was caused by the release of cyanobacteria laden water from Lake Okeechobee. 
Red tide is a naturally occurring phenomena in the Gulf of Mexico. But when the algae rich water uh, from Lake Okeechobee reached the Gulf, the nutrient rich water inflamed the red tide. And we all, I think, remember the effects of the massive toxic vice of both the red tide and the blue green algae. Tons of dead fish on coastal beaches and a devastating impact on Florida's tourist based economy, including hotel occupancy, restaurants, fish charters, and even real estate values. Uh, there was also an increase in hospital admissions for people who suffered respiratory discomfort during the outbreak of red tide. The long term health effects of red tide are not fully known. Uh, blue green algae and the connection of blue green algae to non alcoholic liver cancer. Blue green algae or cyanobacteria produces cyanotoxins, that is, poisons. One toxin, and I have to say there are numerous toxins produced by blue-green algae, we are just beginning to scratch the surface in our understanding of the toxins produced by blue-green algae. But one toxin, microcystin, is a potent toxin and a human carcinogen that is a cause of non-alcoholic liver cancer. Research published in 2015 linked the distribution of non-alcoholic liver disease in the United States to the location of cyanobacteria blooms. The World Health Organization has set guidelines for microcystin concentration for drinking water and recreational water use. During the historic outbreak in Florida in 2016 and 2018, Two scientists that I work with uh, from the brain chemistry labs, Dr. Paul Cox and Dr. James Metcalf, came to Florida and took water samples and reported that the microcystin level in samples from Lake Okeechobee and the St. Lucie Canal were 300 times what the United Nations recommended as safe. In that paper, um, on the effects of the 2016 cyanobacterial bloom, Cops, Cox and Metcalf noted, and I just want to read two sentences from their conclusion. Based on the microcystin content reported here, it is reasonable prediction that the cohort of Florida citizens exposed to the 2016 Florida cyanobacteria bloom incident, including children of underprivileged families that we witnessed picnicking, fishing, and swimming in cyanobacteria contaminated waters may experience an increased lifetime risk of liver cancer and or hepatic dysfunction requiring hospitalization and transplantation. Uh, lastly, blue-green algae and its connection to neurodegenerative diseases. Cyanobacteria, uh, blue-green algae, also produces another neurotoxin called BMAA. And BMAA has been linked to neurodegenerative diseases, principally Alzheimer's and ALS. And more research, of course, needs to be done, but all of the evidence is pointing in the same direction. Um, and this is from doctors with, the, with whom I uh, work closely. Uh, the University of Miami Brain Endowment Bank reported that BMAA toxin is found in the brains of people with neurodegenerative diseases. Dr. David Davis of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine reported that monkeys fed BMA developed symptoms of ALS. And in another study he did, uh, he documented that monkeys given BMAA develop the amyloid plaque and tau tangles that are the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Um, let me just add one thing before I get to the, the principal part of what I wanted to talk about in that the toxins that I've talked about in blue-green algae also are airborne. Um, there's a Dartmouth uh, uh, doctor, Dr. Elijah Stommel, uh, who has reported that people living near water with heavy blue-green algae concentration blooms 
have a 15 times greater chance of getting ALS. Uh, Florida Coast, Florida Gulf Coast University marine biology, biologist Mike Parsons has found airborne cyanobacteria toxins a mile from ponds and three miles from the Caloosahatchee River and so on. Let me talk about, so this is bad news. I think in the, uh, uh, you know, as I said earlier, in terms of the title of this panel, who's winning? I, th I really think that the people of Florida are being slowly poisoned. Now, what can be done about it? I wanna offer about uh, six political um, suggestions. Suggestion number one, public education. Exactly what, your, what the two organizations are doing this evening. Uh, information is power, and information is the oxygen for organizing change. People need to be alarmed and angry about what's going on, both about the health risk and that toxins are not only in the water and the food supply, but also are airborne. Now, I think there has been some progress. Several years ago, whenever there was an outbreak of red tide or blue-green algae, um, the discussion was about the impact on fish kills, on the tourist-based economy, on fishing tourists, on fishing boat captains, and so on. Now there cannot be a discussion about an outbreak of uh, blue-green algae or red tide without also a discussion about the public health consequences as well. And that's because water quality advocates have made a point. They've used public education to affect the narrative. The second suggestion I have is that we have to forge common interests. There is a divide and conquer um, uh, factor that is taking place. Um, Blue-green algae comes down the east and west estuaries. Red tide occurs in the east. Sugarcane burning occurs in Palm Beach and Harding County, Hardy County. Phosphate mining occurs in uh, West Florida. This, we, you know, we have to be concerned about what's happening statewide, about the failure of our policies to have effective regulation that protect public health. And we need to do so by forging a common interest and not operate within our own idiosyncratic uh, bubble of, con of concerns. Third, we need to focus on the right policies, policies that directly address the problem. We need strategies that prevent pollution at its source. As our former governor, Bob Graham, used to say all the time, we need to prevent Vent pollution at its source. Most of the water in Lake Okeechobee comes from the north and the west. We need to focus on pollution that is dumped into Lake Okeechobee that feeds the blue-green algae, especially runoffs from phosphate and nitrogen fertilizers, from dairy and cattle farms, from human waste, from failed septic tanks, from development uh, in the northern uh, Kissimmee watershed as well. Uh, we also need enforceable regulations, and that involves the political will to impose regulations on powerful interests, principally agribusiness. Number four, we need warnings to the public. If the state refuses or is unable to enact enforceable regulations, the least it can do is to warn the people of a health risk. Uh, the Department of Health has routinely dismissed the long-term risks of exposure to harmful algal blooms and, and, uh, and arguing that the suggestions of chronic liver or neurological diseases are unsubstantiated. Um, the failure to take into account this mounting scientific evidence tells us that uh, the the uh, state agencies are allowing the people to be slowly poisoned in Florida. Number five, I think we have to be, we have to have a realistic political analysis. And what I mean by that is two things. Number one, this is a complicated area and water battles have been going on in Florida for decades. And we need to figure out 
and understand correctly all the various interests that are part of this war about water quality and water quantity. Um, there's uh, the agricultural community, municipalities that are fighting for drinking water. There's the need for water for Everglades restoration. There's water uh, to feed the tourism and recreation industries and their environmental concerns about water quality. But the second thing I, I mean by that is that we have to understand that Florida is ruled as a one party state. And legislation does not pass in Florida unless it's embraced by Republican leadership. Republican leaders may grant the hearing on a bill sponsored by the minority party, but that's usually as a concert, as a courtesy. Uh, but with few exceptions, legislation will not be enacted unless it is sponsored by Republicans and approved by Republican leadership. That means that we have to make a decision about whether we want to make a symbolic political statement or actually secure uh, public policy. Um, by, by a symbolic political statement, what I mean by that is that we can find any legislator to sponsor a bill, but that doesn't mean it's gonna pass. Uh, we need to do the hard work and the hard work is recruiting a Republic legislators to this cause. And unless we uh, recruit Republican legislators to this cause, we're not going to enact effective uh, public policy to address uh, th this problem. Um, of course, we need Republican legislators to sponsor the legislation. The sixth thing that I wanna say is that once we do find Republican sponsors for this legislation, we have to organize all the elements of a campaign, very much like a political campaign. We need a catchphrase. We need endorsers. We need trusted messengers. We need to use social media. We need to use advertising. We need to use a logo. The Sierra Club is well on its way to doing that with uh, the Stop the Burn campaign. I think that's a good model to, uh, to look at very carefully. But the last thing I wanna say is, and this is maybe the most difficult thing to say, is that if we understand who can make the changes that will protect the public health by imposing meaningful regulations on the sources of pollution, which in Florida is principally agribusiness, then that is the legislature uh, who enacts policies. It is the governor who advocates for those policies in the legislature and who directs the regulatory agencies. And I wanna leave you with this very difficult, but maybe un unhappy message that ultimately, if you wanna change the policies, you need to change the policy makers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, for uh, bringing this all together and uh, giving us some direction as to where we can take this. So I think uh, all four speakers have been terrific and have really uh, covered these issues very thoroughly. Uh, we, we have some time left where we can take some questions and answers. You can send them in on the chat. We can dig a little bit deeper into uh, the issues that have been very, very well defined. So the first, first question I have uh, about the studies, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at this focus tonight on the health implications and Howard just, you know, identified Floridians are basically being poisoned on many levels. So when we see the health implications, it seems to me uh, policymakers, somebody needs to respond. And the answer we always hear is, well, we don't really have good studies. And uh, just recently, you know, there was a big series in the Palm Beach Post and ProPublica. They dug deep into the data. They showed that the emergency rooms and hospital visits spike during the burn season. Uh, they made a case for, well, it sure sounds like it has something to do with the uh, sugar burning. Uh, U.S. Sugar, Florida Crystals came out and said, there's no link. This is poor data. This is not good study material. Uh, and over the years, uh, in both the uh, sugar burning as well as more recently with the algal blooms. There have been attempts to do studies, but they 
just seem to be started and they don't go anywhere. Uh, when we hear a comment from industry, from an agribusiness industry, oh, these studies don't prove anything. Let, let me put this to our, to our physicians. What, what's your take on that? Ankush? Yeah, so, you know, this kind of reminds me of the tobacco industry. Uh, they were saying this for, 30, for 40, 50, 60 years. There were tons of studies that showed the link between tobacco and lung cancer long, long before the first U.S. Surgeon General said that smoking causes cancer um, 50 years ago, 50, 60 years ago. Um, what we need to do is, number one, more studies and robust studies. But again, the, your point, too, that the studies don't really go anywhere may be an issue of funding. A lot of the research funding in science comes from the federal government or nonprofit organizations. So number one, I would say we need to get the, the federal government to fund these studies, and we need to convince not the nonprofit organizations and the, and, the, and the benefactors to help fund those studies so that we can have more of the data. So that's phase one. Phase two is, okay, now that we have the data, we've got to do exactly what Howard said, is that we've got to change the politics so they actually read the studies and they actually follow the science. I know that we're in an anti-science era right now, uh, not just COVID, but everything, including climate change. Um, but I think that's, that's, that's the approach we gotta take. Because once you have the data and the data is convincing you have, and you have study after study showing the link, you can't really argue with that. It becomes more of politics and, and, and silos. So, Tony, I'd, I'd like to hear your uh, perspective on that. You made reference to the fact that uh, getting the big sugar and agriculture interest involved in the discussion, and, and you sort of suggested that they had interest. My question would be, have you been able to have any conversations? It seems in almost everything I read, uh, whether it's a news report or official organizational report, uh, and, and meetings we've tried to have, seminars over the years through the Medical Society, through League of Women Voters. Uh, you reach out to the big sugar industries and either get no answer at all, or they just give you some type of routine statement. Oh, we really care about the environment, thank you. Uh, with that in mind, ha have, have you actually had any positive contact? Uh, I, I put that out to Tony. Who needs to unmute? Okay, we'll, we'll give him a moment on that, but I'll, I'll, I'll put that out to uh, to Patrick. Uh, sure, so uh, I, I wouldn't say we've had uh, too much positive uh, uh, contact, uh, but you know, and unfortunately, um, you, you know, certain uh, uh, meetings that could have been uh, uh, fruitful uh, just at a local level uh, uh, that were proposed, uh, you know, never seem uh, to follow through. But I'd like to, to in reference to um, the issue of sugarcane burning uh, in particular, and, and a point of, of research that I've, I've looked into uh, to try to, that would be so important um, to really move the ball forward on the transition to green harvesting is with um, University of Florida, uh, UF IFAS uh, uh, does uh, agricultural research. And, uh, you know, similarly how there's been a, a, a lack in, in major studies on the, the health issues, there's been a lack in, uh, you know, ongoing research on the benefits of green harvesting here in Florida. And uh, I've been able to attend events and speak to individuals there. And, uh, you know, I've been told that, hey, we'd love to do more research on uh, green harvesting, but, uh, you know, the industry provides the funding that dictates the, the direction uh, um, uh, of where we go with the research. And, um, you know, it really uh, um, uh, was frustrating to hear that uh, I spoke with a, a sugarcane uh, breed, uh, um, breeder who uh, was responsible for developing new varieties. I talked about green harvesting and, and could you make a certain breed that would be best suited 
uh, for green harvesting and flooring. He said, sure, but you know, there's, there's uh, burning is a predominant practice and uh, you know, there's no uh, you know, incentive or funding you know, to do that kind of breeding. So, you know, I, I think that there, there needs to be, uh, uh, you know, a concerted uh, effort to, you know, uh, provide funding uh, for such uh, important research. But ultimately, without the political will, uh, and, you know, uh, it was touched upon how we do live, uh, you know, in an anti-science uh, uh, climate, you can't just think that, uh, um, you know, getting a, a, a smoking gun research is enough, especially when there's so much money involved. So uh, it, in the political process in particular, uh, I mean, you're seeing it play out in Tallahassee right now, SB uh, uh, 2508, uh, uh, which is a very, uh, you know, pro sugar piece of legislation, uh, you know, uh, against the best interests of the environment and Floridians as a whole. And, uh, you know, so it needs to be, you know, a collective uh, approach, but fundamentally when the public pressure is to a certain point, uh, when it becomes, uh, you know, too unpalatable for politicians, despite all the money from uh, uh, the sugar industry they receive, uh, you know, to, to continue that course, that's uh, uh, when we're really going to get uh, the progress that we need to make. So, um, you know, it's got to be, uh, you got to hit it from all angles. Uh, and uh, the political, it's got to be a combination of the research with, uh, you know, the public pressure to ultimately create the political will we need. So uh, we all need to work together. So I see Tony is now Sure. Can I pick up on uh, what Patrick was saying? Let yes. me... Uh, let me offer a uh, maybe a dissenting voice uh, in this thing. I don't think the problem is information. <laughs> I, you know, I more studies, more research. Of course, and it's always good. But this is the problem we have in Florida is not the lack of information. The problem we have in Florida is the lack of political clout and the entrenched interests who are keeping the status quo. Let me give you one clear, I think, clear example. This governor was elected a few years ago and uh, by claiming to be the champion of the environment. And one of the things that he did was recreate uh, the Blue Green Algae Task Force, which Governor Rick Scott allowed to go dormant. So he created, he brought together probably five of the best scientists in the state of Florida and organized the Blue Green Algae Task Force. They met for two years, they're still meeting, but uh, after about a year or 18 months or so, they made recommendations to the legislature and the governor. And those recommendations were, look, we know what the source of blue-green algae is. It's, it, it's a lot of things. It's key septic tanks. It's uh, um, malfunctioning uh, municipal sewage treatment plants. But the overwhelming cause of blue-green algae are nutrients into the water from runoff from farmlands. Um, and so that went to the legislature and it hit a brick wall of the lobbying impact of the Farm Bureau. So what we, what we have, have in Florida is not a lack of information, is a lack of political clout. I think people don't understand that the regulation system that we have in Florida it's mostly a voluntary regulation system called best management practices. I don't remember the last time. In fact, there may never have been a time in the history of Florida where a significant agribusiness company was fined for polluting. It's, it's voluntary compliance with best management practices. This is not a problem of the lack of information. It's a problem of the lack of political clout to change the regulation system so we get to something closer to polluters pay. So on that note, uh, I would ask, are we moving in a slightly positive direction? I mean, we had one governor who denied climate change, denied global warming, had, had a uh, mantra, it was, uh, I guess, an executive order that you couldn't even use those words in any official state publications. <laughs> then uh, when uh, the next governor, our current governor came in, as, as you mentioned, he made a very big deal, like in the first week or two uh, that he took office, that, oh boy, hey, we're gonna improve water quality, we're gonna save the Everglades. Uh, is that in itself somewhat significant? 
the, the change in uh, attitude? Howard, Patrick? Hey, can I? Can you hear me? Yeah, Tony. We got you now. Um, actually, I want to. I sort of I think I have a position in between the last couple speakers. Good. You know, in in the United States, nothing changes unless somebody sees a, can see a personal gain. And I think that one of the strategies that needs to be employed is to be able to show sugar that there's a gain to, there really is a personal gain to, um, or there's a gain for the industry if they change their practice. The other group of people that, you know, nobody's really mentioned are third party payers for medicine. If you can actually develop the data through rigorous studies and you can show Blue Cross and United that um, that this kind of practice is costing money, it will get to CMS. And if and if all of a sudden people that live in this area no longer can get cover for their GI problems with Medicaid because of this go this is going up, then then you start to get some political will. But there is going to have to be a bigger stick that it's just a better thing for everybody. Because mm -hmm. one thing I've noticed since moving to Florida, this is without a doubt, probably the most thoughtless place I've ever lived in. I think everybody's pretty much out for themselves. All the corporations are pretty much out for themselves. And there really is no community will from what I can see. So in that context, often it's asked, why bother? Why are we even doing this? You know, you have the Politicians don't seem to be concerned all the way down to the local level. We have uh, local mayors and uh, city council people who just kind of act like these are not issues we need to really pay attention to. You have uh, state and federal lawmakers similar. You know, we, we look at uh, people who, who, who are progressive, liberal, open-minded, who are still supporting the big business interests. You know, we, we look at a guy like Alcee Hastings, and he is a big supporter of sugar and said, we don't need to regulate any of these things because we don't want to endanger any jobs in the area. We see this uh, on a local level. Uh, we see back to the thing about trying to do studies. From what I understand, sometimes it's very difficult to get people to participate in the studies. When they wanted to involve fishermen in algal studies, they, they couldn't get guys to participate because they thought that would interfere with their business interests and they didn't want to tarnish that. So in this type of environment, I think the question comes up, why bother? Well, can, can I just add that, uh, you know, it's easy uh, uh, to get, uh, you know, demoralized, uh, you know, from, you know, looking at, uh, uh, you know, all these, these intersecting uh, issues. But uh, l let me just, you know, say to add a point uh, of positive emphasis, just from the perspective of, uh, of the Stop the Burn campaign, I've seen so much improvement, uh, you know, since when we first started. Uh, you know, it was hard to get any attention on this issue. Everybody thought that, uh, you know, even uh, folks locally, you know, people are looking at them like, really? You think anything, uh, you know, can ever change? But just look at the recent media coverage uh, uh, and, and how there's, there's been so much attention uh, on this issue. And that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of these really important campaigns, you look throughout history, it doesn't happen overnight. It's called movement building. And, uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a step-by-step -step process of building, uh, you know, the power uh, that's necessary enough to ultimately, you know, push decision makers and corporations, uh, you know, to the point uh, of the solutions we're all uh, uh, working for. So all I can say is that, you know, we need to focus on, you know, building uh, uh, as strong of coalitions uh, as possible and causing as much good trouble as possible, uh, putting the pressure on politicians uh, and letting them know that they can't vote against, uh, uh, legislate uh, uh, against uh, Floridians' will uh, in the environment and not 
receive any uh, uh, negative consequences as a result. And, um, you know, just people, a, a small core group of dedicated people, which is what I've seen with the, the Stop the Burn leadership team, uh, constantly speaking out against, uh, you know, pushback from the sugar industry, you know, locally, you know, they're seeing uh, the results from the fact that now the larger public is paying attention. It's been so hard uh, uh, for folks to pay attention uh, upon this, but you got to start with that public education uh, and making as many folks aware as possible, uh, you know, and in the end, what, uh, I mean, what better way to spend your time, you know, uh, uh, to work towards such a, a worthy cause. And by working towards these, uh, such a worthy cause, taking a step-by-step -step approach and, and celebrating the little victories, you know, you, you take yourself away from the demoralization that otherwise, you know, can just, you know, crush you when you take on those issues. So that's, that's my two cents. Patrick, I really appreciate those encouraging words. I think that's, that's something that we really need to hear. And, and Kush, as a, as a physician, you know, you were involved and actually set up the organization of the uh, physicians uh, dealing with the uh, climate action. Uh, have you seen movement in positive direction? Do you have some encouraging words for us? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I, I wanted to piggyback off of uh, Patrick's comments because it leads right into your question. And this reminds me of the broader climate change movement where there's this term which some of you may have heard called eco-anxiety. Um, and it's, it's, it's a big issue throughout the world where people are kind of feeling like, well, what's the point of dealing with climate change? Because we're just about to hit that, that, that limit where if we, if, we don't, if we do something but we don't do enough, it's not going to make a difference. We're all going to be doomed. But that's not really the case. And what you can do is, yes, it takes time and you build up the movement. Um, you, you get people to understand through education as well as through grassroots work. Um, and I've seen this. I've seen this with physicians in the US. I've seen this with physicians and community activists um, worldwide when I've been to the last two COP meetings. Um, where there's people throughout Europe that are holding European governments accountable. There's people in Latin America holding Latin American governments accountable. And there's people throughout the U.S. in different parts of the U.S., not so much in Florida yet, but in other parts of the U.S. that are holding those governments and those corporations accountable. So I think there, there is positive, there, there is a positive outlook. And that's part of the reason why we started Florida Clinicians for Climate Action to get doctors, nurses, and other people who work in healthcare, number one, educated about climate change and environmental has, uh, um, toxins and, 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 and everything related to that. But also then the next step is to take action, to educate patients, to educate policymakers, and then to lobby those policymakers in Tallahassee and in Washington, D.C. to actually do something about it. Well, thank you so much for those encouraging words. Incremental change, and we just need to be patient and stay the course is my takeaway from that. We, we need to take a few of the questions from the chat because we've been asking for questions that we haven't addressed those yet. So let me just pull out a couple of specific ones. Uh, Arlene wants to know what would be the cost to altering the burning process to a better one, such as what they're doing in Brazil. So I think that's, that, that's pretty good because the, the take on this is that uh, the sugar industry doesn't want to go in that direction because of the fiscal impact. Patrick, I'm sure you have data on that. So first and foremost, uh, you know, there would have to be a, a detailed, uh, you know, economic uh, impact study to, to, to come up with any number. But the, to simplify it, a lot of the resistance uh, comes along the line of uh, it would be more labor intensive. So that means you'd have to look, uh, the industry would have to look into things, which is what we have been promoting, uh, such as corporate partnership, cor forming corporate partnerships with companies that could come in and, uh, and utilize uh, uh, the sugarcane trash that currently isn't being utilized, and also infrastructure uh, um, investments, uh, which can be done uh, at sugar hill uh, at the sugar mills, uh, for instance, uh, 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 biomass uh, separation units, uh, detrashing units, they've been called, uh, can make green harvesting, uh, you know, much more economically uh, uh, palatable. But um, you know. Uh, uh, ultimately, uh, and there are these companies that are that are you know trying uh, uh, to set up shop uh, here in Florida doing biofuels 
uh, is the most exciting uh, uh, opportunity in particular. In fact, there's a company called Verde Visions that would like to come, uh, uh, that has technology to convert the sugarcane trash uh, into a form of biodiesel fuel for the shipping industry. Um, and, uh, but ultimately, you know, it's going to cost the sugar, sugar industry. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, if they're willing to make uh, the uh, short term investment so that they could benefit too within the long term. But uh, an added uh, uh, obstacle is the nature of the federal sugar program, uh, which uh, insulates uh, the, the sugar industry uh, from a lot of the, uh, uh, from competition uh, on, uh, as far as uh, the global sugar market. Uh, uh, because domestic prices uh, are protected so much that um, uh, sugar within the United States is sometimes worth two times what it's worth, the global market. And, you know, that is, is created a way in order to maximize the bottom line is to uh, reduce their overhead costs uh, uh, as much as possible. But, um, you know, certainly uh, if, uh, with the political will, if there's the political will gets there for the re regulations to increase, to cut down on burning, the sugar industry in no time, uh, I'm sure, will be able to make it out uh, uh, and make the transition, which has already happened uh, across the world, uh, Brazil, Australia. They got a transition going on right now in Thailand, uh, India, uh, and even the African nation of Zimbabwe has a full Brazilian style, uh, used the whole sugarcane uh, plant uh, as well. So if all these other countries uh, can make it work, I say it's an insult to American ingenuity uh, uh, to say that the multi-billion dollar uh, Florida sugar industry, uh, you know, um, can't stay afloat uh, by modernizing uh, their practices. So with some luck in time, Palm Beach County perhaps will not be the anomaly that it is at this stage. We have a clinical question from uh, Kay Gates. She says her northern raised asthmatic son's breathing problem usually accrued in the spring and the summer when plants bloomed and went to seed. So the question for our, our pediatrician, are you saying that asthmatic children locally, their asthma is not set off by plants but instead by the cane burning? That's for you, Tony. or Ankush? Um, so it can be caused by both. Uh, that's what I'll say just generally for asthmatics. I don't treat children, but generally for asthmatics, it can be, it can be caused by both. However, those people that live around the sugarcane burning, it's probably caused more by the sugarcane burning than by the pollen from flowers and trees. Not to say it's not caused by that, but that's probably going to be the predominant thing. Um, I don't know if Tony has anything to add or to that. Well, if we're still muted there. Yeah, at, at any rate, it's complicated and we need more studies, of course. And, you know, in medicine, we always talk about evidence-based versus anecdotal. And a lot of this, we could say based on the timeline is a bit anecdotal, but when you have so much anecdotal evidence, uh, it certainly makes you think that we can prove it in an evidence-based way, I would think. Here's an interesting question that links the two. Is there data on the effect that the nutrient-rich ash falling on Lake Okeechobee has on the green algal blooms? Hey, so uh, I have uh, uh, reviewed uh, research um, that uh, um, you know, has a rough uh, estimation uh, that just uh, under the category of atmospheric deposition. Uh, um, so basically, uh, to describe atmospheric dep deposition, all the, the, the smoke and ash that comes up uh, you know, eventually through precipitation, sometimes acid rain or the black snow itself is going to fall back down. Uh, um, you know, in the nearby waterways. And I've spoken with a, a researcher from FAU uh, who has been able to determine, uh, you know, trace amounts of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen within uh, uh, the ash that he's found in nearby uh, canals. But uh, I'd say it's really hard to come up with a, like a, a, an estimate uh, or a rough figure uh, as to what, um, you know, the total contribution compared to all the other uh, contributions that, uh, you know, goes into that, uh, you know, toxic puzzle to quote uh, the documentary and all the different, um, you know, sources, but it, uh, that lead to algal blooms. But it's certainly a contributing factor. 
And um, another thing uh, that I found within the research I've seen is that uh, the burning uh, increases rates of soil erosion, especially within the EAA. And that uh, diminishes the soil's ability uh, for water retention. Uh, so ultimately has a contributing factor uh, in runoff pollution in nearby waterways, whereas the alternative of green harvesting uh, helps reverse soil subsidence uh, when the leaves and tra uh, trash are left to decompose and build up the soils, and that increases water retention. Um, so, you know, that goes into, um, you know, another aspect of the win-win uh, uh, of the environmental benefits of switching uh, from burning to green harvesting and how that can have an impact uh, on, on water quality in the long term as well. So I have a question. Uh, we, we said there's a lot of things going on in Tallahassee right now as we speak. We see things in the news. Uh, we made some reference to SB Senate Bill 2508. Uh, so Howard, could you just elucidate that a little bit? I, I've read so many news articles. To me, it's so confusing what's going on there. And everybody has an opinion and they amend it and then they pass it and then they move it on to the House, but then the governor's against it. Uh, can you simplify this for us? Well, I'm not sure I have the latest info on it, but it was a, uh, a last minute sneak attack by the uh, Senate president, uh, who is a candidate for agriculture commissioner um, to essentially uh, reprioritize what is going to happen with uh, water out of Lake Okeechobee to essentially uh, write into statute that the top priority would go to um, agriculture interest in the EAA, which is largely uh, the, largely sugar. Um, th that got removed from the uh, from the bill, um, and which is not to say that the bill is now is still good. It, it, but uh, but some of the most offensive parts of the bill were removed. Can I? But Brett, as long as I have uh, the microphone, I, I want to say say something on a slightly different. I, I hope I didn't say anything earlier <clears throat> that led to a uh, a tone of defeatism. Uh, this is the the sense that I that I got from some of the earlier comments because I I do want to say. I think this is a war. This is a war that's happening in a battle between uh, people who want to protect public health and special industrial interests. But, um, but we have to fight this battle and, and not give up. And one of the things that I want to urge clearly for the league and everybody else is that this is an election year. Going back to maybe some of my more political comments, this is an election year, and this is the year in which we have to make the issue of public health in Florida a principal issue in this big campaign. Uh, we're going to elect a new governor or re-elect the current governor. We're going to elect a new agriculture commissioner, and the legislature is up for re-election. Those are all the people that can enact legislation that protect the public health. And there's going to be a debate, for example, between uh, the incumbent governor and whoever wins uh, the Democratic primary. Public health has got to be a principal issue before the voters this year. And uh, I, th I think the uh, groups like the League and the Sierra Club, but all the other allies that are part of this coalition need to work to make that a principal issue. Uh, before the voters and before the politicians this year. This is how I think we respond to the war, not, not with any defeatism, but to come back and to try to make this a major issue for the voters, because it is a major issue in all the different things that we've been talking about, whether it's uh, uh, the black snow, whether it's radioactive waste from uh, phosphate mining, whether it's blue-green algae or red tide, there is a public health crisis in Florida, and we have to make uh, what will the politicians be doing to address this problem, the major political issue uh, in this coming election. Thank you. And I think that ties in very much with the educational message that we, through our collaborative work, need to put out so that the voters can make informed choices when uh, they go to the voting booth, if, if they can get through with all the new changes in the voting law. That's a whole. <laughs>
that's a whole nother discussion. Okay, well, the hour is getting late. We could go on for two or three more hours, but I think uh, some people have to get ready to go to bed at this hour. Anyway, Drs. Ankush Bansal, Dr. Tony Pearson Shaver, Patrick Ferguson, and Howard Simon, thanks so much for a most provocative discussion. We didn't solve everything tonight, but we're moving in that direction. And, and we've had a few requests that if we can get a written copy of Howard's six suggestions. So uh, I'm sure we'll be able to get that out to everybody. And I, I think this, uh, this type of seminar needs to be repeated, certainly needs to be repeated next year. These issues are not going away anytime soon. This program will be archived and it will be shown in a lot of venues where hopefully uh, it can make a difference. As we've said just now, collaboration of experts in, in the arenas of healthcare, environmental justice, the strength of the Sierra Club and the League of Women Voters, while working together, I'm also optimistic that, that we can indeed affect a positive change, have some type of positive impact. Again, thank you everyone on our panel. Thank you everyone who attended the meeting tonight and have a good evening. Thank you everyone, have a great night. Mary, would you like to stop the recording and we'll go on to the Loxahatchee?